Seven minutes past eight this morning here on OTBM and I'm delighted to say Samuel Luckhurst is with us, Chief Manchester United writer at the Manchester Evening News. Good morning to you, Sam. How are you getting on? Good morning. Very well, thank you. Thank a, you for having me on. A nice quiet time for you over uh, the last few months, I suspect, as you were trying to read the room and see exactly what was going to happen. Um, can you just take us back to the, the decision to go with Ranić? How close were anybody else to actually getting the job in your estimation? I don't think any really came any close to Rangnick and his interview pitch. Uh, obviously, there were some names that emerged before his name. Uh, on, on the Wednesday, I think I did the story that he was a, the preferred candidate. You had Ernesto Valverde. Um, I think Lucien Favre was another name that came out. Uh, the, the shortlist might have been as, as many as five, but those were the two names as well as Rangnick's that I was I was aware of, at least. And really, Rangnick came in on the Tuesday, I think it was. He flew in and did his pitch, and they were very impressed. And on the back of that, they decided that he was he was the one they wanted as, as an interim. If they couldn't get Pochettino, which they, they couldn't, Paris Saint-Germain were just playing hardball there. By the time Rangnick flew back to his home, uh, the contract offer had arrived. He didn't like it. He rejected it. United thrashed out these revised terms that included the, the two-year consultancy role. And he liked that and he's accepted that. And we're just, we're just waiting for him to arrive now. In terms of that two-year consultancy role, do we know what shape it's going to take and what influence he'll have? Is it about transfers? Is it about coaching? What, what is it about? Well, United have been very vague at the moment and I don't think we'll have an inkling uh, as to the specificity of it until we speak to Rangnick, which still might be a while, uh, given that he's not going to be in charge for the Arsenal game if he is in charge for the Palace game because of the timings of that, where United are playing a Thursday this week, they won't have a pre-match press conference on the Friday. That That's just the way United operate. So in terms of that consultancy role, the irony is that they overlooked Rangnick and other candidates for the football director role, which is occupied by John Murta, because they were deemed to be too synonymous with recruitment. They wanted someone who had a broader remit, who had more experience of dealing with um, the administrative side of football at the club. And Murta was in charge of recruiting the women's team in 2018. And at one point, he he managed the academy as well. So this is this is a big about term because Rangnick clearly, given his hit rate, is is going to have to have some input in recruitment. And given United's hit rate with recruitment, even in recent years, where it's it's seemed better than it has been uh, before Ole Gunnar Solskjaer came in. It's still not actually been that good if you look at the way some players have been playing over the last year. Samuel, when you say they liked his pitch and, and he flew in for an interview, who's actually in the room? Who's, who's making that call? Well, Ed Woodward is still making that call, which I know is going to baffle a lot of people because uh, he's he's serving out his notice. Uh, he's still due to, I think, due to step down in April. John Murta is still um, is still involved. I say still involved. He's he's been at the club for eight years. John Murta, but where they finalised this structure in March with him as football director and Darren Fletcher as technical director, they see those two as quite key to the decision making process. That said, a lot of people I've spoke to in the industry who've had face time with Murta and Fletcher, uh, more face time than I have, anyway, as journalists. Uh, are still a bit baffled by their roles. Fletcher's a technical director, but I, I can't think of another technical director in football who's pulling his boots on, getting involved with training, and is now in the dugout um, a hell of a lot as well. He's watched games from the press box with the analysts this season. He's watched games from the director's box with Richard Arnold, and now he's in the dugout. So there's some confusion as to his role, but United seem to be at pains to justify the existence of this technical director role and the football director role as well. In fairness to John Murta, uh, who's in, in the latter role, uh, he, he was one who was actually pushing for Rangnick, or so United say anyway. He met him in 2019 where he did a, a recon reconnaissance fact-finding mission at Leipzig. Uh, he, he met him again uh, during this pitch that Rangnick gave last week to be the interim manager. Richard Arnold was the other one uh, involved, the managing director who everybody expects to replace Woodward as executive vice chairman next year. Uh, so Richard Arnold's background is actually on the commercial side of the business and he's been hugely prominent in transforming Manchester United into the juggernaut that they're in. And in, 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 in succession terms, it actually probably makes sense to have 
a load of football people around him so he can continue to focus on that and make sure that the business of the football side of things is run properly. Whereas with Woodward, it was kind of like he's a little bit of everything, certainly believed himself to be um, a football... He believed himself to have enough knowledge to be able to contribute when the football decisions were being made and we've seen that that has not worked out. So I, I can see some sense in having beefing up the intellectual quotient of the football side of things, I still don't understand fully what the roles of the three men were going to be when you have a technical director and a football director and now a chief football consultant or a senior football consultant, I think was the exact terminology. Yeah, it is it is baffling uh, at times. It can get confusing. Uh, the, the line of reporting is effectively still to Woodward. Woodward rests below uh, Joel and Avram Glazer, who are the only Glazer siblings that have any real dealings with anyone at the club. They're the ones who uh, are listed as the co-chairman, the other four siblings, just shareholders in the club, effectively. So Murta will just report into Woodward. I don't know yet, nobody's actually specified yet whether Rangnick will report into Murta or whether Murta will report into Rangnick, given that Rangnick's role is on a on a two year basis. It, it could be longer than that. Don't know, but uh, they probably still need to clarify that. The fact that Murta is is happy for Rangnick to come in, even though from the outside you might have thought Rangnick would be coming in and, and treading over his toes, I suppose bodes well. But it doesn't bode well for this structure that they finalised in March, which they thought was a really big progressive step forward. And again, they've been at pains to stress how key uh, Fletcher and Murta have been in this process of recruiting Rangnick as interim manager but going ahead ultimately the main kingmaker next year is going to be another um, chap from the University of Bristol who if you, if you speak to people and and, and and they're quite candid with you will tell you that his, his preferred sport is rugby which has been the case with Woodward that's apparently the case with Arnold as well and when you just look at some of the things Arnold has said, whether it's speaking about the, the commercial side of United or the football side of United, he puts his foot in his mouth a hell of a lot more than Woodward ever has. And during these conference calls, whereas Woodward now just sticks to speaking about football, uh, it's Arnold who will you know, gush about all the guff about the app rating or the, the Chinese pipeline or the, the, the next noodle partner. So unfortunately for Richard Arnold, when he does comes when it does come to him replacing Ed Woodward there are going to be a hell of a lot of humiliating quotes that are going to haunt him that he's going to he's going to struggle to live down unfortunately for him maybe the the beefed up football side is the type of thing where he doesn't talk about the football and the, the three lads go forward and that's the holy trinity as it, as it goes on that then who will be responsible for recruitment well it's <laughs> how long have you got really the the, the manager has, has always had a veto on whether a target should be signed or not. Uh, the recruitment department have a veto as well. The recruitment department is headed up by the technical chief scout, uh, Mick Court. W when we got wind of this recruitment department, you, you wondered whether it existed, whether it was just uh, you know, something that was floating in the ether and was used in, as an excuse for that pretty uh, fraught summer they had under, under Mourinho in, in 2018, where he was determined to have a centre-back signed and uh, in the end the, the word that came out from United was that they were vetoing his, his targets and his suggestions. So again this is another convoluted process in that you've got the football director who the manager will report into so for the next six months or so that will be Rangnick. Um, the recruitment department gather data. There are month, I think there are sometimes monthly meetings on recruitment uh, they'll start prepare, they'll have started preparing for next summer's transfer window in September. So that's the way they should be. Uh, any football club should be going through that process. But again, where you've got a manager in charge until the end of the season, then he's a consultant. It's, it's a strange dynamic there in terms of preparing for recruitment next summer because a new manager will be inheriting those players. I don't think too many managers will, will be concerned about the situation with possible outgoings because United, by all accounts, seem to have just given up the ghost on Paul Pogba, given up the ghost on Jesse Lingard in terms of signing new contracts. Enson Cavani and Juan Mata are well into their 30s. They barely figure as it is. Clearing the decks should be welcomed by whichever manager comes in. 
but that manager is still going to come in quite late on when it comes to recruitment and planning because United like to try and execute deals in February and have deals in place. So this is still three or four months before the new manager is due to come in, unless they have a Tottenham-style scenario where they're going around in circles, being rejected by managers left, right and centre. So for, for the next six months, Rangnick will have heavy input into recruitment, um, as you'd imagine he should do, given his, his background, his hit rate and the players that he's unearthed. But there is still the possibility that someone in the recruitment department will, will veto that, although given the egos there, given from what I've heard about Rangnick and how controlling he can be, I don't think anyone in the recruitment department has got a profile that that, that could really get away with vetoing him. But according to United, that's what they did with Mourinho. What what does uh, success look like for Ramnick then, Samuel? Like, is is it just getting into the Champions League, or is he trying to do that while also reforming the football side of the club from top to bottom? Or does that does that process start when he becomes the consultant? It's an interesting question because when they sat Solskjaer, the the, the effectively the background briefing they gave on it was was so. Um, glowing that you wondered if they'd sacked him. Uh, they talked about how he'd restored the soul to the club, all these academy graduate debutants. But when you look at it in terms of this whole restored the soul, I, I don't really think it stacks up. I mean, this year you had the Super League fiasco kick off and he ended up defending Joel Glazer to some supporters who stormed the training ground pace. Um, his, his tenure ended up with him getting booed as well. Uh, last season was a pretty solar season because there were no crowds present at all. Bar the odd result, I mean, it's a bit like Casablanca. They, they'll always have Paris. It's, it's that result against PSG, which effectively secured his uh, position as his permanent manager. But with Rangnick, uh, because of the way United were, I, I, and, and because of the way the season's gone, I do think if they finished top four and, and that was it, no trophy, the way the, the, the world view of the Glazers, of Ed Woodward, of Richard Arnold, they would probably view that as as a success. And I don't think many United supporters would view it as a success. It's not like they're miles off um, when it comes to qualifying for the Champions League. They've they've still got a Champions League knockout tie to play. The, there's an FA Cup campaign. They're not going to win the Premier League, obviously, which is already a failure because that's what they were gearing up for this season. It was to at least challenge for the Premier League and that challenge has ended before it even started. So it's got to be a, a, a top four place because if they miss out on Champions League football again this season, it's, it's just happening too much and it's not a great... Um, it's not a great position for the next coach to inherit because then you've got a big player like Cristiano Ronaldo who's completely synonymous with the Champions League is he actually even going to settle for Europa League football next season would he want out that becomes another subplot altogether and it just makes it for very shaky foundations for that next new permanent manager The Telegraph this morning are reporting that Roberto Mancini is in the frame as a potential long term manager is that Gore do you think would that make sense in the current system I'm not surprised that Mancini's name has um, has emerged and that he's he's got a great affinity with Manchester and there are guys that he's he's dealt with in the Manchester pack before who who are still reporting on on both clubs. Italy might not qualify for the World Cup, so if if, if they go out and um, he's he's not got he's he's pretty much out of a job really. If, if Italy don't qualify for successive World Cups, that it was disastrous enough when they didn't qualify for Russia. Never mind. Um, in, in Qatar in November next year. So it, it would be a strange position to be in, in, but clearly I think Mancini would like to like to manage Italy at, at a World Cup, but if he doesn't, he's got to look and see what's out there. It would be a strange dynamic if Italy went out um, of the World Cup before it's even started and United decided, you know what, he's the guy to to bring in. Um, and also I just don't, I think his, his character, again, United have wanted to go for compliance. They've kind of moved away from that now with Rangnick, who is a controlling personality. But I think Mancini is possibly a bit too antagonistic yeah. for them, similarly to Conte as well, which is why they didn't go for him. Yeah, exactly. Samuel, great to have you with us. That was brilliant. Really fascinating insights. Thanks a million for joining us. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day. That's uh, Samuel Luckers there, Chief Manchester United writer for the Manchester Evening News. Uh, loads of interesting little nuggets there. Pogba essentially gone. Yeah. Uh, Jay Ling's essentially gone. So we'll see. A lot of wage, Bill. Yeah. And and getting but no transfer fees. Uh, it's true, no transfer fees. But um, 
uh, why they gave Mata a new contract that all seemed like the emotion of the whole thing was more important than the finances and the facts and um, right here is uh, oh, it's actually Jonathan Wilson is going to be with us in, in one second we're going to talk to him about the actual style of play um, it, good question what is success what, what like not it not blowing up in their faces over the next few months that kind of constitutes success at this stage right I thought. I mean, I, I was scrambling for the league table there to see how far off they are. But the, I mean, the Champions League seems like. I mean, I, I presume they're looking for some sort of Tuchel effect, that they can he can galvanize the squad, create a system, and go and on a run in a, in a knockout competition. And and you know he obviously has the pedigree to be successful. Although he hasn't won an awful lot in in, in his career, but he's he's influenced a lot of winning coaches. So that's what they're hoping for. But. I, I presume it's getting back in the Champions League from the club's point of view to maintain where their status so that when they're appointing a manager and they're keep trying to keep Ronaldo they uh, they have that in their pocket but yeah. I mean, in, I, mean I, I, I don't know I, I mean that's what the club's looking for I don't know what the fans want the fans seem quite happy with Solskjaer as they slid down the table so it's I think of, they weren't allowed not, not to be happy yeah. it was like it was kind of too much self-loathing involved and uh, but he's one of us so he, they need an overhaul of the cultural the footballing cultural architecture of the entire club but whether the will is there there seems to be just the names that were coming out there of people who were actually making decisions just is baffling there's, there's no they need a football director who can actually clear house and a technical director you. or a football director? Oh. <laughs> OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. 